Okay, this lecture is on module 17 of the curriculum. Happens to be the last uh, module um, in Cisco 1 entitled Build a Small Network. So basically what they're going to do is pull together a lot of things that um, you learn throughout the semester. There may be um, some new things that they add in here, uh, but that's kind of the purpose of this module. So under why should I take this module, basically what I just said, to put together what you've learned this semester as far as designing, building, configuring, and uh, troubleshooting a network. Um, in particular, here's a list of things we'll do. We'll go back and talk about the various devices that you might encounter in a small network. Um, we'll talk about um, network appliances and um, protocols that we may have in a small network. We'll talk about scaling up to larger networks as far as size. We'll talk about verifying connectivity to prove that a network's working or to determine what parts of a network or what devices are reachable and not reachable. Uh, we'll talk about some of the configuration, troubleshooting, uh, debugging commands, uh, both from the perspective of a host computer and from uh, Cisco devices running iOS. We'll talk about troubleshooting uh, methodologies and we'll look at some uh, troubleshooting uh, scenarios in this chapter. So starting with um, small uh, network devices, um, here we have uh, a topology. Uh, again, we have a cloud. This might be your home or it may be a small uh, business network, uh, but you're going to have some type of a multifunction device or router that connects you to the internet via your ISP. You may have one or more switches. You may have access points for wireless access inside your network. You may have voice over IP phones, you may have computers, you may have laptops, um, you may have servers, um, you may have printers. In this case, this is a network printer connected to the switch, not connected to um, any uh, particular um, host. So um, down here, they're saying that large networks may require an IT department or a networking group to maintain, secure, and troubleshoot those. But in the case of a small network, it may be a, a single individual, um, a local IT person, or they may contract out. Uh, so since it's smaller in size, it won't take as many people uh, to manage the network on a day-to-day -day basis. 17.1.2 has, um, talks about device selections. So it talks about the different types of um, things that we may need to worry about when we're making our decision. Um, the first is cost. Um, of course, um, you know, this is um, cost of the devices, cost of the intermediary devices, cost of the router, um, cost of the, the wiring, either the, the copper wire or the fiber cable. Um, as you get um, more ports or you switch to fiber or you get faster ports, uh, of course that's going to drive the cost up. So you either need to budget for that or make a selection based upon the, the budget you have already been given. Um, another thing that you will want to consider is um, the speeds and um, types of ports. Uh, again, the, the faster the ports or the higher end uh, ports that use fiber, things like that, uh, so you can do 10 gigabit per second is going to drive uh, your cost up for your network solution. Typically, you need some expandability. Uh, you know, if you have 16 devices and you buy a 16 port switch um, and then all of a sudden you hire another employee and maybe need a voice over IP phone and or computer for that person, um, it's probably going to be way more costly to accommodate that than if you had done something like buy a 24 port switch 
so that you had some expandability, some room to, to, to grow. And then finally, you need to look at what operating systems um, you're going to have and then what services you need to provide. You know, are you going to have something that does NAT um, or are you going to have to buy something that does NAT for you? Um, do you already have something that can do dynamic host configuration protocol for the host in your network? Or do you need to buy another server to run DHCP? Uh, do you need quality of service built into uh, your routers? Um, and are you going to be doing voice over IP? Uh, if so, you need to make sure you buy equipment that allows for these. Um, some cases that will be more expensive equipment. Other cases it may just simply be additional equipment. When you're going through um, your network design, uh, you need to think about um, what things need IP addresses, how many IP addresses you need, and how are you going to come up with an addressing uh, scheme, uh, a logical addressing for the network. So you'll have end user devices. This will be uh, printers, voice over IP phones, may even be smartphones, laptop, desktop, servers, uh, that type of thing. They actually put servers down in the next one. Servers and peripherals, uh, which may be security cameras, printers, or actual servers. And then you have the intermediary devices, which would be um, your switches and your access point. Um, so here, they've shown a topology, and they've gone through and... You know, they were given 192.168.0.0, it looks like. And, well, uh, .x, .x. Um, and what they did is they're going to take the third octet and say, here's one network, here's another network, here's a third network, for example. And then using this scheme, they would be able to have 254 devices in each of these little yellowish uh, squares they have. So if that's enough devices, this would work out. It also allows them to give out uh, 256 uh, networks. So if 256 networks of 254 host works for you, then, then this would be a perfectly uh, good scheme to, to go through and do that. Uh, what they've done down here is they've come up with a scheme for giving out IP addresses. Uh, for example, uh, the, the router is going to have the IP assignable address uh, through um, the dot one or dot two IP address. They're going to allow for two switches, which would be dot five, dot six. Uh, they will allow for six access points, which would have the IP address in the subnet X of dot um, nine through dot fourteen. Then they would have six servers, six printers, six IP phones, sixty-two wired devices, and sixty-two wireless. So this is one possible scheme. Of course, you have to come up with things that would work for, for your scenario. And then what they're showing here is they're showing using this scheme uh, for the dot two subnet, how they might go through and give out IP addresses to the device and uh, the default gateway uh, for that network. Um, Redundancy, um, you may have redundancy in a small network. Um, here they're showing you a way to, instead of having one switch and one router, to have two switches and two routers and go through and um, kind of crisscross them. Uh, sometimes you might even crisscross between these routers and these switches uh, so that if one of these devices is down, you have uh, at least one alternate path um, to still get to the service or in this case the servers that they're showing. Now you're basically doubling the equipment and 
adding uh, more than twice the wiring in some cases. So obviously redundancy comes with a price. So you have to decide or somebody in your organization has to decide how much is it worth to have redundancy and to have your machines always up or close to always up. Okay, um, as far as traffic management, there's different types of traffics uh, that, that you may have. And what they're kind of showing you here is, um, as we've talked about before, some traffic needs a higher priority uh, to function better. So basically, you have to decide, do you have this situation? You have to classify the traffic, and then you have to have a device that will allow you to implement your, your quality of service uh, that you think you, you need. Um, 1716 is a check your understanding over the devices and concepts that we talked about in section 171. And as always, you can do that on your own. And we'll move on to small network appliances and protocols. Uh, so basically, a network appliance is a device that provides um, some type of service. Um, you may also have applications running uh, that provide services to the, the network. Um, so what they're calling network applications or applications that communicate over the network. Um, or need to communicate over a network to function correctly. The application layer services are programs that interface with the network and prepare, prepare data for transfer, such as preparing a print job to be spooled um, to a print server so that it can ultimately uh, be um, printed. Uh, down here, they have Task Manager running on a Windows machine. Um, couple of things on here that would be uh, services that use the network is um, right here they have WebEx uh, which is a video conferencing uh, screen sharing debugging tool I would call it uh, looks like they have crash plan running which is a remote backup server um, that you can buy so it looks like whoever's machine this is has chosen to back up using crash plan and of course that would be over the the network um, into quote the cloud um, here we're talking about um, common devices and things that we might uh, make use of so if we go down here and look um, it's kind of backwards from normal. I guess they have the graphic above and then uh, change um, the text about it. But we have web server selected. Um, of course, it's going to receive a request for web pages and then serve those web pages up because it is a web server. Um, the client machines are going to communicate with this web server using the hypertext transfer protocol. That's what HTTP stands for. They may also use HTTPS um, uh, for secure encrypted communications. Um, another, um, it's not a network protocol, but they would use HTML, hypertext markup language, um, to define the web pages um, to be rendered. The next type of server in this graphic is the email server. Um, it's going to use SMTP. Uh, we talked about that fairly recently. Um, SMTP to get from a client machine to your local mail server. Possibly SMTP to get from your local mail server to the recipient's email server. And then as far as reading the email, um, you're probably going to use POP or IMAP um, to, to read the emails. Um, so your email client software would talk to the email server using those protocols. Uh, FTP server, uh, we don't do things over FTP servers as much as we used to, 
but they're going to use the file transfer protocol. That's what FTP stands for. Um, there is a secure version of FTP uh, that allows you to transfer data. And um, this, we haven't been talking about ports. Um, on the web server, it's going to use port 80 for HTTP, uh, port 443 for HTTPS. Um, your mail server is going to use port 25 for SMTP. It's going to use 110 for POP. The FTP server um, actually uses two ports, uh, port 20 and port 21. Uh, if we move on to um, the DHCP server, uh, that's going to be for um, dynamic host configuration protocol. Um, so that's where the machine um, is going to get its IP address, its subnet mask, uh, default gateway, and several other things that I may have you look up in a, a homework assignment. And then finally, we talk about the DNS server. Um, its responsibility is primarily changing a name into uh, an IP address, but we do have something called a reverse lookup where you provide the DNS server with an IP address and it will return um, its name for you. So uh, DNS server is very important. Uh, if a DNS server is down and you can't resolve names into IP addresses, that's when typically you get a call that says, hey, the internet's down. And I have to kind of bite my tongue and not go, all of it, really? But to the end user, they can't get to anything, so they view that as the internet is down. Okay. Uh, voice and video applications are uh, very heavily used. Um, even more so these days with um, COVID-19 and us uh, working and teaching and learning uh, from home. Uh, if you're going to do voice and video applications, they're a little more demanding um, on the network and services. Um, so our infrastructure must support real-time applications. Uh, you know, you don't want your video pausing or cutting out when you're talking uh, to somebody in a meeting or, you know, these days when you're talking to your doctor and not allowed to go to their office, uh, but have to have a conversation with them um, over the computer. Uh, you need to validate that your, your wiring is sufficient to handle the, the speeds that you need uh, for your infrastructure to, to be uh, reliable and if you have older equipment that for example only supports 10 megabits per second um, you probably need to upgrade to at least 100 megabit a second if not um, gigabit per second uh, networking. Uh, voice over IP is um, when you take analog signals and turn them into digital IP packets. Uh, you know, a lot of providers allow you to bundle your internet, your TV, and your telephone um, into one service coming in either over the phone lines, over the cable, or over a satellite. Uh, that type of phone, um, if you do that, is uh, voice over IP. You may actually have a handset, or you may be using something like Skype uh, that, that is making the, the call uh, for you. Uh, so IP telephony is uh, the software and hardware that allows you to connect your voice over IP infrastructure together and use it. And then finally, real-time applications. Um, a lot of times you need quality of service to make sure that the packets uh, that need um, priority um, get the, the priority. Uh, there are a couple of real-time transfer or transport protocols they talk about down here, RTP and RTCP, uh, that may be used uh, in that infrastructure. 1724 is a check your understanding on small network applications and protocols. Of course, um, you do those on your own. 
and we'll go and talk about um, scaling to um, larger networks. So if we want to grow our network, um, there are several things that will be required, um, and they're listed down here. The first is network documentation. You need a physical and logical topology of what you have now so that you can tell how to grow and what additional infrastructure, whether that be uh, networking devices or cabling, uh, that you may need. Um, if this documentation doesn't exist, then you'll have to go out and inventory it so that you can work from it. The device inventory is a list of devices that use or make up um, the network. Uh, so this may be routers and switches, but it may also be end user devices. Um, you also, and this varies, you may be given a budget and you have to make sure that your growth fits within that budget. Or you may need to go through, make a reasonable network design, and then go to your financial people or your boss, higher ups, and say, you know, this is the problem we have. This is where we're trying to get to. And to get to that point is going to cost this much money. Um, and then um, you should have a traffic analysis uh, for several reasons. We'll talk about that a little later in the chapter. Uh, but in this case, you need to know what protocols and applications you're supporting um, so that you can make sure that when you grow the network, you still have the bandwidth, infrastructure, and protocols necessary to do everything that you need to do uh, in your network. Um, okay, the, talking about protocol analysis, this is kind of small. Um, so I'll click here on this icon so that it takes up the full screen. Um, this is a, a protocol analysis. It's basically anal analyzing what protocols are on the network and what percentage of the traffic um, they make up. So if you notice up in the top left, this is actually Wireshark. And they fired up Wireshark. They chose the appropriate interface that they wanted to monitor traffic on. Uh, then there's a statistics menu item, and under that statistics menu item is, um, I think it says, um, protocol hierarchy. And it will go through and show you hierarchical. For example, at, a, at an Ethernet label, it sees IP version 4 and IP version 6. Uh, there's basically nothing. You know, 18 packets of IP version 6 out of about 40,000 uh, packets. Uh, so basically, there's not a whole lot interesting there. It might be interesting to see what's doing those 18 packets. Um, but they expanded IP version 4. And then you have UDP and uh, TCP are the next two labels. Um, it's about 50-50 as to what's going on. If we look at TCP, we have uh, about 20% of that is secure uh, socket layer stuff, so probably web pages. Um, but then if you look down here, HTTP is nothing. But again, it's secure, so maybe that's HTTPS. Uh, we have a very small percentage of ICMP going on. We have a couple of percent of ARP going on address resolution protocol. Um, so this is looking at your network. Uh, one thing I want to talk about while I have this up, uh, we may talk about it later in the chapter, but uh, if it's not in the curriculum, I, I think it's very important, which is the concept of benchmarking. So periodically, you know, you might want to let this run for you know, an hour or two or four or maybe a whole day and then um, save that and then, uh, you know, maybe six months down the road, a year down the road, go back and do the same type of thing to see is the division of traffic uh, pretty much the same or all of a sudden do you have something new on the network that is 
sending lots of packets. It doesn't necessarily have to be something malicious. It can just be another service. For example, you put in voice over IP phones on everybody's desk. So how has your network um, profile or protocol hierarchy uh, change over time? Okay, another way to look at utilization is what are various employees doing? Um, so it, sometimes it's handy to have what they're calling a, a snapshot. Um, I would say this could possibly fall under the term uh, benchmark that I used earlier as well. So what OS do they have on their device? How much CPU is their device typically using? How much RAM is it using? How much is it utilizing disk drives? Um, you know, what non-network non -network applications does it have running? And what network applications it has running? And how much traffic um, they're using? Um, so down here, um, they go into settings, um, usage details. And you can see uh, for some period of time, uh, looks like the last 30 days, um, it's done 4 gigabytes over your VPN connection. Um, the system um, has used 2.51 gigabytes of Wi-Fi bandwidth. Chrome has used 1.45. Um, not sure why there's two Chromes listed here, but the second one's used 880. Um, Outlook Mail Client, um, Cisco Collaborate, Collaborate um, has used uh, 438 megabytes, it looks like. Um, and then again, periodically, you may want to double check or have the user double check, depending on how you're going to handle that, to kind of benchmark and compare to previous benchmarks or snapshots uh, what's going on on their machine. 17.3.4 is a check your understanding about scaling to larger um, networks. Um, so you can do that on your own. And we'll move on to verify um, connectivity. So we've talked about this on um, at least two or three occasions. Uh, the simplest way to verify connectivity, especially end-to-end -end connectivity, is using the ping command, uh, which is based on ICMP. So it sends an IP ICMP um, echo request and hopefully gets an echo um, reply back to show that the packet made it from PCA all the way over the internet to PCB and came back. Um, so of course that's ping. Uh, down here, we, we have a graphic um, on a PC. Um, if we do it on a PC, it's going to send um, four packets by default and give us um, some timing information. Um, if we're on a router, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to send five packets instead of four by default. And then it's going to give you a summary. So this that this means success. Um, we sent five packets, we got five exclamation points. So it's going to take this information and basically uh, give you minimum, maximum, and average. Um, so, you know, basically most of these takes um, on average one uh, millisecond. Um, as far as the ping indicators, an exclamation point, like I said, says that it got the echo reply message back. Um, so you have layer 3 connectivity uh, between the source and destination. Uh, a period indicates that um, something went wrong. Um, along the way so you don't have connectivity and a capital U means that the destination is unreachable which is typically a routing or routing table um, issue. Um, down here they're talking about extended ping. 
Uh, kind of what they talk about here is not what I first thought they meant by extended ping. Uh, to me, an extended ping is pinging more than the four or five times by default on a router or a Windows machine. In the case of Unix, uh, ping is indefinite, and when you want it to stop, you have to break out of it with um, Control-C. Um, basically, what they mean here is changing some of the parameters about ping or how the ping is going to occur. Um, how many packets you send is one of the options you can change, uh, but there are several other things. But again, uh, the repeat count is going to be uh, the main thing that, that I would change. Um, so to get an extended ping on a router, you say ping and give it no arguments. And then it asks you what protocol you want to use, um, what the destination IP address is, the repeat count. So if you want to do 100 packets because you thought that would give you a better set of statistics, you can type 100 there. I've also, when I've been debugging problems, you know, I'll start a ping on my Mac OS X server at my house to a device at UK's campus and let it run overnight um, to see if I lost packets. If so, what time did I lose packets? Can I figure out why those packets are not making it to uh, the destination? Um, how big a packet do you want to send? Um, how long do you want to wait before you decide that the packet's not going to come back to you? Um, on and on and on. So you can change all the things or a bunch of things about how the ping is going to uh, go about. Um, of course, hitting return at any of these prompts is going to take the default value that is listed in uh, square brackets. Um, 17.4.3 talks about um, trace route. Um, again, this is using ICMP, the same protocol Ping uses, uh, but kind of doing a little trick with uh, the time to live or the hop count uh, to map out um, the, the network. Um, so what happens is it will go through and start um, uh, measuring. It'll do three packets for each device so that it can average out or show you um, the time variation. Um, an asterisk means it got no response and you know it may time out. Um, usually you want to let this run for a while. You may get some asterisks and then you may start getting legitimate data. If that's the case, it just means the device at 2, 3, and 4 um, are configured not to reply to ICMP request. Technically, that's a violation of the RFC uh, for ICMP, but it's a very common thing to do. We talked about ping scans uh, when we talked about security in a previous module, and you know, if it doesn't respond to a ping, then hackers may not even know that that device exists on the network. Um, you can do um, trace RT uh, from a PC, which is what we were looking at here. Uh, from a router or a Unix machine, it is going to be trace route uh, completely uh, spelled out. And it's going to work uh, very similar. Um, okay. On a router to break out of um, trace route or other things that um, are not um, timing out or timing out all the time, Control Shift 6 is the way you do that on a PC or a Unix host. I think I mentioned it a moment ago, but it's Control C. Uh, to break out. Um, you have extended trace route um, just like you uh, have extended ping. Again, that is to allow you to change uh, parameters. Um, here we're on a command line prompt on a Windows PC. Trace RT and of course um, slash question mark gives you the help. Here's some of the things that you can go through and um, change 
you know, by default, maximum hops is something like 255. If you want to limit that, uh, you can. Um, you can change the timeout in milliseconds. You can force it to use version 4 or version 6 of IP. Um, so here they're doing the extended trace route. Uh, they gave the target and source um, IP address and then they go through and you get the output uh, of the ping from the router 1 that we're logged into all the way to 10.1.1.10 which was listed as target IP which is just another way to refer to the destination. Uh, network baselines, um, I called them benchmarks, but again, you should periodically do this. Uh, again, I'm not sure if there's a more appropriate place, but one of the network baselines I do is a speed test at home. Uh, anytime I assign a speed test to one of my Cisco classes or to my 111 class, actually do a speed test partially to make sure that the websites that I send my students to are, still exist and are still functioning correctly. But at the same time, I print copies of those out for my network baseline. So I have a snapshot at least two times a year of how, what my uh, network downlink and uplink speeds are so that if I need to all of a sudden notice it's slower uh, you know, I have documentation that I can share uh, with my um, ISP. Um, here, uh, they're talking about you should do it at approximately the same time. So what happens is on August 18, 2019, they did a ping. They printed this out. A month later, they came back and did a ping. And notice that instead of things being sub millisecond, all of a sudden we have um, 40 or even 50 millisecond response time. So something has happened. We're not having any packet loss, but our response from the machine we're on to 10.1.1.10, whatever that is, maybe that's one of our servers, has gotten really, really bad and gone from basically you know, an average of zero milliseconds up to uh, 48 milliseconds. So that allows you to, you know, basically not have to remember, oh, this is what I normally get. You, you save it as uh, documentation. Uh, 1746 is a lab on testing network latency with ping and um, trace route. Um, so it's having you ping from your machine at home, uh, different machines, um, in this case, uh, around the world. Um, so I will be assigning this, so watch for it to appear in Blackboard. And then that finishes up section 17.4, so we'll move on to high host and iOS commands. Again, a, a lot of these uh, we have seen. Uh, we're going to first talk about IP configuration on Windows, Linux, and Mac machines. Um, so here's IP configuration. Uh, we are looking at the uh, network connection details from the Network and Sharing Center. And we can see here, uh, unfortunately it doesn't look like there's a way to blow this up, uh, but you know, here's a description of what type of card we're on. Here's the MAC address, which they're calling the physical address. DHCP is enabled. Um, here's our IP version 4 address and subnet mask. This is when we got that IP address. This is how long we have it for or when our lease expires. Um, here's our default gateway. The default gateway also uh, provides DHCP services and DNS services it looks like. And then here's the link local IP uh, version 6 address. Um, so that gives us IP information both version 4 and uh, version 6. 
Um, down here, we're running IP config, which will give you um, a summary of information. Um, here we have the link local address and the IP version 4 um, information. Of course, hopefully it's ingrained in your mind that you have to have an IP address, a subnet mask, and a default gateway for a device to communicate on the internet, uh, capital I. Uh, if you do IP config um, slash all, it will give you all the information it has. Um, probably the most common thing you would need would be the, the MAC address, but there's other um, information in there as well. Um, if you need to, if you think something's wrong with your IP address, you can do an IP config slash release, which gives up your lease um, prior to the expiration date. And then you would want to turn around and say IP config slash renew, which would cause the PC to go through the DHCP uh, process uh, again. Uh, so here, uh, you know, they had, where is it, uh, 192.168.10.10. Um, after they did the renew, um, it looks like they got .1.124 and um, a new uh, default gateway as well. Um, another thing that's handy um, that a lot of people don't know about is the option to IP config, which is display um, DNS. Um, so it will tell you uh, what DNS server um, you're using and its um, IP address. In the Linux world, um, there's a couple things you can do. Most um, Linux operating systems have a graphical user interface. So here's a network uh, connection information panel, very similar to what we saw in Windows that would have that information. Uh, we can also do it from the command line. Um, it is if config. Uh, a lot of times people say, why isn't it I can P config like it is on Windows? And I tell them they're asking the question backwards because Unix existed first. So why isn't it IF config on a Windows machine like it is on Unix? And the answer is, I guess somebody at Microsoft thought it made more sense to say IP config. In the Unix world, IF stands for interface. So if config is interface configuration information. And again, here's the internet or IP address. Here's the internet version 6 um, information as well as some other uh, statistics about the interfaces. And similar on a Mac OS X machine, uh, this is um, system preferences. So basically, they went into system preferences, chose the network, um, clicked on the TCP IP tag. We can find out that it's using uh, DHCP. Here's the IP address, the subnet mask, and the default router. Um, if you click renew, DHCP list, I'm sorry, lease, it's going to release the IP address and then request um, DHCP again uh, where it may get the same or a different IP address. Uh, so that's the graphical user interface. Um, Mac OS 10 machines are Unix machines. So we can go to the Unix command line prompt using um, the terminal um, program that's in applications utilities on a Mac. Uh, we can use if config. Uh, EN0 is the primary wired uh, NIC. We can get the hardware address and IP address, both version 4 and version 6, and get information that it is um, this interface is active, so, so it's actually using it. Um, down here, uh, we have network setup, dash list all network services. Um, so it's going to go through and tell you that you have Wi-Fi, you have IS, or sorry, USB iPhone, um, etc. 
you can do network setup, get info on the Wi-Fi, and it will give you uh, the same information here uh, that it's presenting to you in the, the graphical user interface. Here, we're going back, um, talking about the ARP command, Address Resolution Protocol. Uh, that's basically, to refresh your memory, uh, the protocol that's used when a device wants to communicate with an IP address that is on the same network. Of course, another thing that's hopefully ingrained in your mind is that when you're on the local network that you're using Layer 2 or MAC addresses. Uh, so the ARP command basically says, I would like to talk to the person that has this IP. And whoever has that IP will say, hey, that's me, here's my MAC address. And then that host will be able to use that MAC address to communicate with the destination on the local network. Um, so here we have a 10.0.0.0 um, uh, network. Uh, they use the highest uh, valid usable IP address for the router interface. So I'm glad they showed that instead of always using .1. Uh, we have different PCs. Uh, we're on PCA, and if we issue the ARP-A command, it's going to say, here's other IP addresses that I have in my cache table, and here's their MAC address. Um, so, let's see, we have two, three, four, but we don't have five. So we either haven't communicated with 10.0.0.5, or it's been long enough that its entry in the ARP cache has expired and is no longer being displayed. Um, if we wanted it to appear in the ARP table, then all we have to do is simply ping that address and then reissue the ARP-A command, and then uh, .5 uh, would appear. Um, as far as iOS devices, uh, this is telling us some common show commands. Um, so show running config shows you the configuration of the router. Uh, the running config again is the active configuration that is in memory. If you do startup dash config that would be the configuration that you would get if you powered off and back on um, the router. Um, Show interfaces is going to show you the interfaces, information about the protocol, um, IP address, and some statistics about errors, errors and the packets that are being transferred. Um, show IP interface uh, will do um, very similar things, but concentrate more on uh, layer 3. Uh, show ARP uh, will show you the ARP information. Um, so very similar to ARP-A, here's an address, here's its MAC address, and here's the interface of the router uh, where we saw or communicate with um, this device. Show IP route is going to show us um, routing tables uh, for the device, in this case router 1. Uh, show protocols is going to show us whether uh, the line protocols are up or down, that is whether the the line or the interface connection is working. And then show version is going to give us um, version information about the version of iOS uh, that we are running on the device. Okay, um, show CDP Neighbors, um, Cisco Discovery uh, Protocol is um, what CDP stands for. Uh, neighbors are devices that are connected to us. Uh, CDP uh, transfers the following information um, to neighbor devices. Um, in this case, we're on router 3. We say show CDP neighbors. The only neighbor that we have is S3. Uh, we see it out the GIG001 interface, and then it gives us some other information, including that this is a Cisco 2960 uh, switch. Uh, so we can tell what's connected 
Um, I've had to go in before and a little earlier we we're talking about what happens if you have to map out a network. Uh, I had a situation where an IT person was fired so they just simply left and had no information. So the first thing I had to do was break into all their routers and the first thing I did when I was on the router is I did a show CDP neighbor uh, did a lot of show commands, but as far as drawing the topology, um, show CDP neighbors was one of the ones I did. So I issued lots and lots of commands and made printouts. And then um, I brought them home and started drawing. You know, this router has this neighbor. So, okay, let's go to those routers. They have this neighbor. And basically um, having to um, discover and draw out their network topology. Um, show IP interface brief will basically tell you what interfaces are um, up and what IP addresses they have. So this was another command that was very handy. Um, the show CDP neighbors as far as Mac, Max, not Max, is documenting um, the network physical topology and then show IP interface brief then help me map out the logical or the IP addressing uh, for uh, the business. Um, here's a video. It's about five minutes long, but I think it's worth playing um, here in line with the lecture. In this demonstration, I'm using the TerraTerm Terminal Emulation Program to get to the console command line interface of a 4321 router. I'll press Enter and then type Enable, and then I'll use the Show Version command from within Privilege Exec mode to view information about the router. At the top of the Show Version command, I can see the Cisco iOS software version that is running on this router. This shows me that the router is running the universal K9 image, which provides all the basic Cisco IOS software features, including support for strong cryptography. It is the extended maintenance package, major release 16, minor release 6, and rebuild number 4. I can also see that the router has been up for 4 minutes. I'll press the space bar to display more output. This tells me the name of the iOS image file and that it is located in boot flash memory. ISR 4300 refers to the hardware platform for which this image was built. You'll recall that I'm using a 4321 router. Again, here is the version for the iOS image file. An SPA means that the image has been digitally signed. The bin at the end of the file name refers to the file format. In this case, it is a binary file. Here we see the reason for the last reload. This indicates that I issued the reload command to restart the router. This information can be helpful when troubleshooting, especially if you have a router that crashes. Below is information regarding the cryptographic features of this router. I'll press the spacebar twice to display the rest of the output. Next, we have information on licensing. It is broken up into two categories, suite licensing and technology package licensing. First, let's examine technology package licensing information. This indicates that we have a permanent license for the ip base K9 package, which is the default image feature set and the package and feature set that was specified when the router was ordered. It shows that it will continue to be available upon the next reboot. We currently do not have any other permanent or evaluation licenses installed. If we wanted to upgrade our iOS or install new features, it is a three-step process. First, purchase the software package or feature and obtain a product activation key or pack. Second, obtain a license using your pack and the UDI of your device or a unique device identifier. And then lastly, install the license. We could purchase a suite license that contains multiple features. 
If we did, that information would appear in this area. Next, we see that roughly 2 gigabytes of DRAM have been partitioned into main memory and shared memory. Main memory is reserved for the CPU to execute iOS software commands and also holds the running configuration and routing table, among other things. Shared memory is used to buffer data as it is transmitted or received on the network interfaces of the router. The contents of DRAM will be lost when the router is powered down. Next, we see the number and type of physical interfaces. This router has two gigabit Ethernet interfaces and two serial interfaces. Next, we have 32 megabytes of NVRAM, or non-volatile RAM, which is electronically erasable and reprogrammable. This is used to store the startup configuration file or saved configuration and the configuration register setting as shown at the bottom of this output. We'll get to that in a moment. The contents of NVRAM are retained when the device is powered down. Next, we see that the router has 4 gigabytes of physical memory. This is the total amount of DRAM, which includes the main and shared memory discussed above. Again, all contents are lost when powered down. Next, we have approximately 3 gigabytes of flash memory, used to store the Cisco iOS software image and other system files. Lastly, we can see the configuration register setting written in hexadecimal. This is the factory default setting which instructs the router to load the iOS image from Flash and then load the configuration file stored in NVRAM. But what if you forgot your password and cannot access your router? You can change the default boot process by altering the configuration register setting so that the configuration file won't load from NVRAM on boot up allowing you to access privileged exec mode without a password. You can see that the show version command gives us basic information about the router, including the iOS version, how long the router has been up, and how much memory and storage the router has. This information can be helpful during troubleshooting or when upgrading your iOS. Okay, um, 17.5.9 is a uh, packet tracer uh, talking about um, and asking you questions about different iOS uh, show commands. I will be assigning that, so watch for that to appear in Blackboard. And we'll move on to troubleshooting methodologies, starting with 17.6.1, which is basic troubleshooting approach. Um, so this is something that you probably learned in 111, uh, may have had it in uh, computational thinking in other classes. Uh, but the first thing you need to do is make sure you understand the problem. So you either need to get that information from the user, or if you're the person experiencing or noticing the problem, you need to make sure you uh, fully understand what the problem is. Uh, then you need to come up with um, some theories as to what's probably causing uh, the problem. And then you want to test the theory to determine if your theory is correct. Um, if it's not, then you need to go back and to step two and establish a new theory and then test that theory. Uh, once you have done the research and figured out what the issue is, you know, then need to come up with a plan of action. Basically, um, how are you going to uh, fix the problem and when? Uh, once you fix the problem, you need to verify uh, that it is fixed. And if it is indeed fixed, was there anything you could have done to prevent that from happening? Uh, if so, you need to document that and implement those preventative uh, measurements. And then you need to document everything, uh, what the problem was, what you tried, what worked, what didn't work. And then your um, outcomes, which could be the implementation of a preventative measure uh, from step five. 
Uh, so you need to document that and put it so that you can find it or so that other networking people or maybe a predecessor can find that if the problem uh, reoccurs. Uh, 16, I'm sorry, 17.6.2 is basically asking the question, um, do you resolve an issue or do you escalate? And this is going to depend a lot on your company. They will have a set of policy. Um, you know, if it's this type of question, you ask it, you answer it. If it's this type of question, you need to escalate it to a higher tier or a person that has more experience than you. Uh, maybe you try to fix it, and if you can't, then you escalate it. If it's going to take you more than 10 minutes to fix it, maybe you escalate it. So again, these are going to be policies uh, that a technician uh, should have been told about when, when they were hired and uh, getting oriented uh, to their new uh, position. 17.6.3 is talking about the iOS uh, debug command. Uh, there's a lot of things you can debug. Here they're saying they want to debug ICMP. Uh, so they turn it on and they do the debugging. And notice that in addition to the normal output, um, you get this debugging information that just appears um, on uh, the console. Uh, you can turn this off by putting the word no in front of it. So this will turn off um, ICMP debugging if it was turned on. Um, you can also say undebug. Um, and if you've turned things on and you just want to get rid of all of it, you can say undebug all. And uh, that will uh, go away. Um, this is um, when you're on the console of the router. Uh, down here, it talks about the uh, terminal monitor. Uh, if you're on a local connection, uh, such as the console port or the auxiliary, or if you're remote, which means you're telnetting in. Uh, so here they're telnetting in, uh, gaining access to the router, going into enable mode, and then turning on the, the debug. Um, so you can go through and do that from um, either the console port or uh, when you're coming in uh, over the, the network itself uh, to get to the device. Um, here, if you do terminal monitor, uh, you're going to see the same um, debugging information. So 17.6.5 is a check your understanding over the troubleshooting uh, methodologies to make sure you understand those. Of course, you do those on your own, and we'll move on to troubleshooting um, scenarios. Um, so these are going to be different problems that you might um, encounter. Uh, so here they're talking about duplex mismatch. Um, a lot of times we use auto negotiation, which is discussed down here in the text, um, so that we don't have this issue. If they can both um, do full duplex, then they'll do full duplex because they can send and receive simultaneously. If for some reason one device is only capable of half duplex and they negotiate to half duplex, that means you're either sending or receiving so your bandwidth is effectively um, cut in half. So down here they're just showing you the routers talking back and forth, negotiating the best or fastest um, operation, which if they can both do full duplex, then they should do uh, full duplexes. IP addressing issues um, on iOS devices. Uh, you know, there can be configuration issues. Uh, it could be that you manually configured it and you mistyped information or simply didn't understand what information you should be putting in and the device was not um, configured correctly. Uh, the other could be that it actually got um, somebody who maintains your DHCP information, maybe uh, did a typo or something 
and caused it to um, give you incorrect IP addressing information. Uh, so that's on uh, the routers. As far as end devices, you, you can have um, kind of the, the same thing. Um, either you hard coded something incorrectly or you were given uh, incorrect um, information. Um, okay, uh, so down here they're just saying you use the IP config command. Uh, to make sure the one thing I was double checking was that the default gateway is in the same network, the dot ten network, uh, based on the the slash twenty four um, subnet mask. I think what they're saying here in the text was maybe it was supposed to be slash sixteen, and they did slash twenty four, which is going to create a problem with you communicating uh, with some host on the network. 1774 is talking about um, default gateway issues. Uh, maybe you have incorrect default gateway, um, so packets won't leave your network. Uh, maybe uh, the default gateway is not working correctly. But of course, IP config on a Windows machine is how you find out the default gateway. Um, if you um, do show IP route, uh, you can basically search uh, for the word um, gateway. Uh, again, they call it the gateway of last resort in some cases. So 209.165.200.224 is your default um, gateway for the router R1. Talked about this a little earlier. Um, usually, if um, you don't have DNS configured correctly, or it stops working, uh, you cannot do a lot of things because it cannot resolve uh, host name into IP addresses. Um, so on this machine, they did an IP config slash all. Um, it lists the DHCP server information, but it also gives you one or more uh, DNS servers. Uh, just kind of a side note, um, talked about this in, in 111, um, at least I do, is uh, Google has a public uh, set of DNS servers that are real easy to remember. The primary is 8.8.8.8, and the secondary is 8.8.4.4. .4. So if you're on a machine and normally you would put a DNS server that was at your ISP, but for some reason you can't find that, oh, if you need to look it up, what would you do? Oh, you would do a web search or go to your ISP's um, help pages. Oh, but wait, you can't do that because your DNS is not working. So you kind of have a chicken and egg uh, situation. So if that's the case, you can set it to 8.8.8.8. .8 then go find what the DNS server really should be and then add it um, to the configuration. Um, NS Lookup is a tool uh, that it will say it's for testing your DNS server, but it also allows you to query your DNS server, and I'd say most people use it uh, for that. Um, you can say NS Lookup space and a name or an IP address, but if you simply say NS um, Lookup, you go into interactive mode. It first tells you what name server it's talking to and the IP address of that um, name server. Then you can do queries. I'd like to know what the IP address of Cisco.com is. Again, it will tell you what server gave the answer, which is the same servers up here. It will tell you the name and the addresses. So in this case, um, it gives you an IP version 4 address and an IP version 6 address. Um, notice that, um, I didn't notice this before, they actually type 8.8.8.8, .8 the one we just talked about, and it says here's the IP address and its name is dns.google. Um, and then down here they um, type another address and this is open DNS. So based on the name it's probably a place that you could go put, for example, 
the IP address and give a name uh, to your public IP on your multifunction device. Eleven seven six is a lab. Um, it's kind of weird. Normally they do the packet tracer first and the lab second. I sign the packet tracer and then tell you we're not doing the lab because it's an online class. Here they did the lab first. We will not do it because the very next section has the uh, packet tracer equivalent. So moving on to the packet tracer uh, 1777. Uh, troubleshooting connectivity issues. I will be assigning this, um, so watch for it to appear in Blackboard. And then the next section is the, the last section of the module, uh, which is practice and quiz. Uh, the first one is design and build a small uh, business network. Uh, basically what this is having you do is think about a network design, uh, go in, use Packet Tracer, uh, you know, it'll start out blank, and then you have to drag all the devices on there, and then um, set up a, a couple of devices, verify that it's working. Uh, I will be assigning this, um, you know, it's about two-thirds of a page as far as the actual assignment. Uh, but it will take you a little while to do because you're basically designing um, part of a small network. Um, 17.8.2 is a skills integration challenge. Uh, again, it's um, about two and a half pages as far as the assignment, but this is a very, very, very involved uh, packet tracer that kind of takes everything from the whole semester and puts it together. Uh, I'm leaning towards not assigning this. Um, if I change my mind, it will appear in Blackboard, but if I don't assign this, I highly recommend you uh, read over it just so you uh, know the type of things it would have you do and the types of things that you should be uh, capable of doing. Uh, 17.18.3 is a uh, packet tracer challenge. Um, in this one, they have addressed the complete network, and then they're having you, um, they give you passwords uh, for the routers, and then they have you go through and uh, verify connectivity and verify you can get to the web server, uh, that type of thing. So, packet tracer 17.18.3. I probably will be assigning, so watch for that to appear in Blackboard. Um, what did I learn in this module? So I never read these to you, but you should go back and read it um, yourself um, to refresh your memory about everything we talked about. And you should know uh, from Module 17, this is probably one of the longer ones um, out of all 17 modules. And then we end up with the module quiz. And um, as always, um, you can do that on your own. And that finishes up uh, the Cisco One curriculum.